to the Blue Ridge Read 2020 and 2021. We tried to do this last year and it didn't work out. But we are delighted to have so many people here tonight. Thank you for coming out on a, a nasty night, but a night that's kind of right for the book. It's true. Yeah. So, um, make sure that your phone is on silence for us. We are going to attempt to take uh, to take this. Um, and also, thank you for caring about your neighbor and keeping your mask on during this time. The only reason we're letting them do without it and me for a moment is so we can understand and hear everybody clearly. Um, the Blue Ridge Read is very happy to be a project of the Allegheny Arts Council and to be associated with the North Carolina Arts Council. The Read be began in 2014 and our purpose remains the same that is to build community by reading the same book. We encourage everyone to read and discuss the, the chosen book with neighbors and friends, and we hope that the shared history can help us communicate and understand each other in different ways. This year, we are united over the New River much better than being in the New River on a night like this, so we will be united <laughs> over the river. We chose the book, The River Keeper, because it was fun to read a book that referred to real places, real people, and even some real events. We're happy to have Marion Adams here, who is um, Ed Adams' um, widow. Um, he's no longer with us, but Thank you for coming out for your support because Ed was instrumental as, as you noticed in this book. Um, it, the, the real events that happened depicted a community joining to fight the development of a dam that would have changed our county and the surrounding areas and who knows where we'd be right now. It demonstrated love and compassion and community spirit, along with mystery and spiritual guidance, and in fact, spirits. So we found many truths in this work of fiction, and we also met a new friend, Sarah. Tonight, we welcome a couple of newspaper folks to discuss the River Keeper with us. Bob has been a great supporter of the arts in Allegheny County and especially of the Reed, so we thank him for his continued support. Sarah Martin Bird is considered a local resident and author, and she's written several books and she has some with her tonight, so if you are interested in getting another book, I just have to point out, look at Manger Mouse back there when you have a chance, not right this minute, don't I? <laughs> but uh, it just has such beautiful illustrations. It's um, a wonderful book to see. I have one. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. It was beautiful. And spirit and uh, in yeah. the illustrations. Mm -hmm. In The River Keeper, she manages to give a voice to the new river as well as to Callie May in the book. Please enjoy learning more about the River Keeper and Sarah tonight. Thank you for joining us. I read the River Keeper some time ago and had some questions I wanted to answer and then managed to maneuver myself to have the privilege of uh, posing those questions to Sarah. and. Um, we're going to have this conversation, and when that's done, if you have questions, we will entertain those too. <laughs> Sarah, you want to you want to say a few words to see if they yes, hear you? Yes, that would be wonderful, Bob. Wonderful. First of all, I am humbled beyond words at the little clip she said about the book because she she nailed it. Uh, this book is so personal to me. Um, I was raised on the Big Elkin Creek. I could look out my back window and see the Big Elkin Creek rolling by. Uh, my husband was raised right on Roaring River, uh, so we're river people. Uh, we've been river people up here since the early 80s. 
And um, if you're not a river person, I don't think that you would understand that book at all. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I thought there might be three people. I'm, I'm you know, like more like 30. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for reading the book. Uh, it's, to be an author and, you know, have people, this many people read it and talk about it. When I first wrote my first book and it came out, I told my husband, I said, you know what would bless my heart would be to be walking down the beach and see somebody holding one of my books in their hand, <laughs> reading it on the beach. Well, I've not seen that yet, but to know all you guys and all these other folks that have read my book uh, just blesses my heart. And if you can ask anything, I'm going to turn it over to Bob and let him get me started here. And, and you might have to shut me up after a while because I've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Don't ask me the wrong questions or we'll be here all night, okay? <laughs> well, Sarah, I'm, I'm interested if you can tell us how you fell in love with the New River. Right, okay. Um, because that is, that is so obvious in the book. Right. Well, just being at the New River. Um, my grandfather uh, lived in Sparta years ago when I was a little girl. And that's my first memories of the river is going across the bridge. Uh, can somebody please tell me when the new bridge was built? <laughs> Bob, anybody tell me when the new um, bridge was built over New River? About what, 20 years ago? How longer than that? It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be like more like 40. <laughs> it wasn't 40 years ago because I came here 40 years ago and the old bridge was there. Maybe it was the middle of 85, around well, 85. Well, that's my first memories, Bob, is of the old bridge. And I remember Dad driving us up when they were building the new bridge mm -hmm. to see my grandpa and see what, you know, what they was doing with the new bridge. Um, but now my f first personal experiences was in the early 80s. Uh, new River Campground was a, was a new campground that had been built right on the Allegheny-Grayson County line up Highway 21. Uh, so we started bringing our tent to the mm -hmm. New River. Uh, we started renting canoes from, uh, it was jo his name was Dwayne, the guy on the right. end. Uh, so we started renting canoes, we started fishing and floating and camping, and that's how we fell in love with it first. And then just to hear the people talk about the river and the stories and the history, and there's, you know, there's treasure hidden. You know, if you've ever floated the 10 mile float, you know where that island's at with the big rock at the, at the beginning of it. There's actually supposed to be some, you know, treasure hidden there. There is just so many stories that that river carries to me, to everybody, I mean, it's just, a, it's amazing. So, uh, as, and we've never missed a year that I can remember camping on the New River since the early 80s. Uh, actually, we were fortunate enough about 15 years ago to buy a little piece of property um, up at New River Campground, and we've had a permanent camper up there for the last 15 years. So we spend our weekends, and since we are both officially retired since last year, me and my husband, we spend a lot of time during the week up here also now. So we do consider the New River, Sparta, Independence, our, our second home, for sure. That's exciting. Um, the Riverkeeper talks about the 1940 flood, and one of the things that struck me was how devastating it was because it uh, rose so quickly uh, and, mm -hmm. and devastated those people that were on the river. Can you tell us a I know you give an account in your book about why that happened. Is right. Was that factual and talk more about that experience? That was partial. Partial. Partial, partial factual. Partial. Okay. It is a fiction book. So, okay, let me tell you about that part. Uh, that part of the book, um, I t I, what I did was I got, this is called Virginia Floods. Uh, this is research. All of this is research for this one little, bo one little book, okay? Um, but what I did was I read these testimonials of people who had been in devastating floods, and I compiled a lot of what they said mm -hmm. into what happened. You know, you know, baby Coy went down, he flipped over a barrel, yeah. uh, stuff like that. Uh, one account was uh, the, they were laying in bed, it's two o'clock in the morning, they finally lay down, and the family had, and he heard this big noise, and he gets up, and there's already eight to 10 inches of water in his house. His house floats off the foundation, and before they know it, the bed has floated to the roof, of the, mm -hmm. to the ceiling of the bedroom. I mean, these things are real. These things really happen. Um, talking, you know, there's not many people that remember the flood of 40, but, you know, but you ask everybody. That was what I did. When I came to the river, 
locals, I would talk to them. I would ask them. I would talk to Mr. Adams on the phone. I did. I never got to meet him personally, but he was such a help over the phone to me <laughs> when I was able to talk to him. Um, but that's where that came from. Now, the flood, the big flood was not in the spring of March. It was in August. So that, I had to change that. That, that did not fall into my plot. I wanted the book to begin in cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it could have been a cold August. It could have been a cold August. But actually, that, 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 uh, that came in from a hurricane. Uh -huh. It came in from a hurricane. Uh, the, the ice dam breaks, those are real. Those are real things that really happen. There is testimonials uh, about, you know, and you can just imagine there's a lot of big bends in New River. And when the ice starts breaking loose, has anybody ever seen the river freeze over? Oh my gosh, freeze up, up toward freeze and the, and the dam and everything. We have seen it freeze over. We have seen humongous big chunks of ice as big as vehicles push campers and decks and stuff back off, off the water. Um, so anyway, you can imagine these big, big, big chunks of ice getting hung in these, in these curves in the river. And then the river starts flooding. The force of it pushes it down and it's just like a big wall of water. And these are testimonials from people. I didn't make all that up. <laughs> so the date actually of the, the flood was wrong. Not right. Um, it was right because it was fiction. It was actually, that actually for real start was 1940. It was not the biggest flood in Virginia. It was the biggest flood in Grayson County. Uh, there was two other floods that were bigger in Virginia, and I think one of them was in 1937, the other one was in 1942. Those were bigger than the 1940 oh. flood. So, okay. okay. The, um, the central character in the book, Kelly May, finds herself in an orphanage in, I believe, Grayson County? Yeah, well, I don't know if it was in, yeah, I guess that's it. Is Foster Falls in Grayson County? Does, can anybody help me with that? With County, I believe. With County, very good. Okay. okay. Um, I assume that was a real place? Yes, sir, it was. Let me, uh, let me show was... you a picture. Oh. <laughs> she has evidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, here we go. It was called the Villages of Foster Falls. If you have never been there, uh, has anybody ever been to Foster Falls, to the Shot Tower? Uh, I walk, it, the, there's a New, Ri New River Park down there uh, with a little camping, primitive campground, uh, ranger station, and all that good stuff. Well, when I was writing this book, we rode the rivers. We rode, we rode every road that we could possibly find, up in dirt road, anywhere we could find. Well, we ended up in Foster Falls one day because that was where the river goes by. Mm -hmm. Well. I knew right away that there was a story there. I knew right away. And it all, and all, while all this was going on, this book was forming in my mind. Uh, and bits and pieces of it were just falling into place. Uh, so what happened with Foster Falls was they, the railroad came into Foster Falls and created this little community. Uh, they, were all, they, were, they were mining whatever you mine to make bullets with. <laughs> Oh, Lead. There you go. They were mining that, and that's where the shot tower comes in. But it, it was such a big operation, they, they had to have a hotel. The hotel housed a lot of the workers. Uh, they had a grist mill. They had a general store. Uh, and by, uh, there was over 200 people there, right, you know, within just a year or two of, of it being developed. The Foster Falls Hotel, this is when it was the hotel. I just passed it around. Yes, that is when it was, a, was the hotel. Uh, this is just some research I did. In 1940, ironically, the same year that Kelly May's family died in the flood, the the orphanage, the Foster Falls Hotel, which had become an orphanage at that time, uh, it caught on fire. And what happened was it burnt the roof off and it burnt the porches off. So this is after the fire right there. Uh, the beautiful part of what's happening there now is that the Foster Falls Hotel is being renovated. It should be opening up to the public if it hasn't already. Uh, this picture, when I went there about 18 months ago to check the progress, the outside was complete. You can pass that around too. Yeah. There you go. The outside of it was complete. It was beautiful. And they were telling me it was going to be open in like six months. Well, that was 18 months ago, and I'm pretty sure it's not open yet. Or if it, or it's maybe recently. But anyway, that's sort of the history of, of, of that. But 
it was a hotel and then when the town when all the lead was gone there was no more mining to be done the, t the town just went away so the ho people who owned the hotel sold it to the Abington Presbyterian Children's Home for one dollar so they at first it was a uh, woman's a women's school where they taught sewing cooking and stuff like that that was what happened to it there for a short time after it was sold <clears throat> then they started the orphanage uh, the, it was a girls orphanage at first and then they built a wing onto the back of it and that uh, then they brought the boys in and so it was a co-ed orphanage at that time in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not going to go back and forth to my notes and distract you, but somewhere in that area, uh, the, the, the orphanage just became in such disrepair that they, they closed her down and they moved the orphanage to Whitfield. Uh, that building had sat empty all those years. It is a beautiful brick building though. Uh, and I'm so happy. I could not believe when they when I went into the ranger's office that day and was talking to them and they were telling me what, what was going on. It just blessed my heart. It's just like it's coming alive again. You know, at one time they mined lead in Piney Creek. Okay. Uh, so apparently this area is good for that. Must be. Um, <coughs> was Kelly based on a real person or several real people? <sighs> well, the, the last name let me tell you how I got na how I get names. <laughs> no. I go to cemeteries in the area where I'm placing the book. There is a bunch of Macaulays oh. around, uh, and old the older cemeteries especially. Uh, I don't know if any are familiar with New Haven Church. Uh, my my uncle went there before he passed away. Well, anyway, I was walking around there, and that's where Macaulay came from. Uh -huh. Is is there? Uh, as far as Kelly May. Her spirit and my spirit are sort of the same. <laughs> we're, we're sort of tough. I uh, won't get into growing up details or anything like that, but sometimes it wasn't pretty. You, know? <clears throat> you have to be leathery. You have to be leathery to survive in this world sometimes. So that's sort of, uh, I sort of fashion Callum May after, after my spirit. You know? but, yeah, that's... Well, that leads me to another question. Okay, and, good. Um, <laughs> You've got some villains in this book. Yes, sir. Were, were they were they based on anybody? Yes, they were. I had. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, let me tell you. I won't go into that either, Bob. <laughs> oh no, that's the good thing. People tell me they they say you know I you know I've been t I've talked about it with other people and they say how could your uncles be that bad that mean? I'm gonna say let me tell you something right now. They can be that bad. I am I'm living proof that they can be that bad. Just because they're uncles or family don't mean that they're wonderful people, okay? <laughs> and money, money, that greed, you know? Uh -huh. uh, and they were poor. Kelly May and her family and, and Granny Jane, they, they were poor. Yeah. And so when they, those uncles got a little taste of that money, they, they become greedy. And that happens in life. That is a, that's true. That happens to all of us. <laughs> Tell me to shut up and you can do <laughs> You know, there are there are two great events in Allegheny County's history that are non-events. One was the fact that the, the the interstate never came through here. Yes. And the other uh, was the fact the dam never came. And there's still some people today that I hear who say we should have had the dam. Mm, it would have been like having yeah. another Lake Norman on the western part of the, the the county. Have you got any thoughts on that? Oh gosh, if I got thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> you need to read this book. If you love the river, if you love where you live, you need to read this book. Uh, this book was written in 1979. Uh, it was rewritten again in 2001. Uh, the, it is, it's a bunch of statistics. Uh, Mr. Adams is mentioned in this book numerous times, numerous times. Um, and I'm not going to read to you what they tell. I'm just going to read a little bit. But I want to tell you what I, what I have learned through all this research. It took me three years to write this book, and mainly because of the research that I, that I was doing on it. Because every time I would turn one stone over, ten more would be laying there ready to be turned over because it was another story right. in it. What happened was in the early 60s, 
you all all probably know the story. The early 60s, this big power company out of New York, who Appalachian Power is a subsidiary of, uh, they came into your backyards. They came in and they started wanting to buy your property. They started telling you that it was gonna be the most wonderful thing in the world, that there was gonna be this beautiful lake formed, there would be tourism coming in to, into the town. Uh, it was going to be absolutely wonderful. At that point, there was going to be one dam built. It was going to be located on the Grayson and Allegheny County lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the big wigs in wherever they live, <laughs> they got a hold of this and they said, hmm, I, can, I, I want to use this dam to flush out the pollutants on the Kanawha, Kana I have to say that word. Right? Kana -ha. Kana -ha. Thank you. I can never say that. River, two to three hundred miles up, down river, up river. And uh, so they went back to the big federal people who, who let you build dams and they proposed a, it was called the new Blue Ridge Project. The original project was called the Blue Ridge Project. They proposed the new Blue Ridge Project. This would build two dams. These two dams would release water twice a day. They would lower the lake 15 feet twice a day. You cannot swim. There would be no swimming. There would be no boating. There would be none of that. But they were still telling the people how wonderful it was going to be. But they were, uh, there was a, a Krauss man in the book, and he was quoted as saying, the big rich Peters were going to be robbing the poor Pauls, is what it boiled down to. They were going to use, uh, you know, our river, mm -hmm. and they were going to use it to push out their trash, their sewer, all their chemical, you know, if you've ever been to, if you've ever followed the new river up through uh, the Kanawha River and through the Gauley, Gauley River, all the way up into Ohio, we've been all the way to the end where it empties into the Ohio. Mm -hmm. you, it's manufacturing plants upon manufacturing plants. Uh, you can see the pollution in the air so you can imagine what's in the river. Well, they wanted to use your river to do that. They wanted to use it and they were, and they, it almost happened. They were so mean that they would go in, and there's testimonials that I've read. Even, uh, did, I don't know if any of you all know Larry Atwood. He lived right here in Twin Oaks all of his life. He told me a lot of stuff. He was our pastor up at the campground for, for several years. Uh, he told me stories about they would come in, and if you wouldn't sell them your property, the, the Appalachian Power yeah. Company went to your house and knocked on the door, and they wanted to buy your property. And if you said no, you were not selling it, then they threatened you. They said, well, we can't have your home condemned. So there was poor people that sold out. Uh, and then, then Larry would tell me that years later, uh, they, the Appalachian Power still owns a lot of this property. Uh, back in the 70s, they were talking about, tourism up here wasn't that big at that time, back in the 70s, not like it is now. I mean, everybody comes to the river now. But the, just to think how crooked that whole thing was, your husband knew it. Mr. Adams knew how crooked the whole he thing knew was. How crooked it was. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was crooked. Uh, so anybody that says we really missed out on that dam not getting built and us having a lake, you tell them the truth. You tell them that it would dev have devastated this whole New River Valley. I just want to read two or three little stats here to you. Uh, it would one of the dams would have um, would have used twenty seven thousand. It would have flooded 27,000 acres, 27,000 acres. That would have been 9% of Grayson County would have been flooded. Can you imagine? Uh, and then 4% uh, of Allegheny County would have been flooded, another 5,800 acres. Uh, there would have been, uh, in Ashe County, 8,400 acres would have been flooded. Uh, there would have been 893 homes that would have been flooded, 41 summer cabins, <clears throat> 10 industrial establishments, commercial facilities like post offices, 15 churches and 12 cemeteries would have been flooded. And then eight miscellaneous other structures would have been, there would have been 2,700, almost 3,000 people who would have been displaced all for somebody else's gain. 
Now that's devastating. You have done your research. Yeah. <laughs> some of this, some of that book is true, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All that is true, okay? You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you started every chapter with a scripture, if I recall. Yes, sir. What led you to, and how did you choose those scriptures? Uh, everything that I write, I want it to be a blessing to somebody. Uh, I know it's not, I'm sure, but, you know, I, I, when I worked, I worked at the Tribune office in Elkin for 20 years, and I wrote a column, a weekly mm -hmm. column called Bird's Eye View, and uh, I wanted that to touch people and to help people. Uh, life is not always pretty. Life is not always wonderful, but it's what you make out of it. Yeah. It's what you make out of it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what makes you who you are. So that's what I do with my books is I want it to have a life lesson in it. And script, the scriptures, uh, I think one of Molly's questions to me or somebody was, do you get those scriptures before you write the chapter or after you write the chapter? Well, it's both ways. Uh, sometimes I know what that chapter's gonna be about and I remember a scripture in my head. So there's where the scripture came from. Uh, there's a part where Kelly May sees this big turtle in the river. Well, I, you know, I, do what everybody else do. I Googled, you know, turtles in the Bible. Because <laughs> I didn't remember reading about it. I've read the Bible, but I've never remembered reading about a turtle in the Bible. So I Googled it. And I found a scripture about a turtle in the Bible, okay? <laughs> so some is, you know, some's before, some is at, during, some is after. The scripture part is very important to me. I've, do, I've done that with my other books oh. also, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your other books? I would love to. I would. Uh, In the Coal Mine Shadows was the first book I ever wrote. <sighs> I finished it in the 80s. And uh, I, I read. I was an avid reader. Read all the time. Uh, and one day I said to myself, you know, why are you reading everybody else's books? Because you had this story in your head. And I did. I had the story. I had the story in. <laughs> you can tell I'm not a professional. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, I wrote I wrote the book, uh, and it was it was I just couldn't seem to get it finished though. So I took a whole week at Christmas off of my job and finished this book. But then, okay, it's the 80s. I had no idea what to do with it. I mean, I had no idea what to do. I had done you know an 18 month children's literature course, uh, but it don't tell you how to sell a book. <laughs> so I threw it up on a shelf. And it laid there until about five years ago. Oh, wow. And then I drug it back out and I finished it because it kept calling my name, okay? Uh, but it's placed up in West Virginia uh, and it is about coal mining. I have a good friend uh, who grew up in the coal mining country. She told me a lot of stories. Uh, and it is dedicated to the coal miners of this world. Uh, they, they had terrible lives. Uh, they, they, when you research this book, the lives that they led was absolutely unbelievable what they had to go through. Uh, so that's the story of a coal mining family. Uh, the gist of this story is that the, one of the girls that was born into this family, she hated her life. So she did some crazy things to get out of that life, which she regretted later, but that's, that's the first book I wrote. This book, people are asking me what I'm doing now. There is a, when you get to the end of this book, it says, uh, Benny is coming. So that means there's got to be a sequel, right? I hate sequels. <laughs> I do. I hate three books, trilogies. I I just never have liked them. But this one had to have have had to have you know more to it. So anyway, this next book is called uh, Shackled to My Father's Sins, and it is at the publisher right now uh, in the editing stage. Yeah, uh, the first book that was published. This was published in 2011, uh, and. It is, it is a story about Sparta, actually. It was about growing up sort of in town with my grandpa uh, living. He lived down 18. There was a big old two-story White House that was down that way on the right. It's not there any longer. Uh, but he, he worked for the Shope Farm, the dairy there. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we, I wrote a book about an old cabin that sits back off the parkway, which is a real place. Uh, we've spent many nights there. A neighbor of ours lets us borrow it. Not anymore because it's run down. The bears have actually scraped, scratched holes in the walls trying to get at these oh, nests. Yes. Uh -huh. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Indian 
artifacts and stuff. Uh, a, a lot of, in, let me back up. The New River, if they had flooded it, do you know that the New River has more Indian artifacts along it, buried along it, than anywhere in the world? Wow. Anywhere in the world. That would have been covered up. Oh, okay, back to this. <laughs> um, there's a lot of Indian stuff in this. A lot of it is uh, about the, tra the history of the Trail of Tears is in this. It's called Guardian Spirit. Um, an Indian's guardian angel is an ant manifested as an animal, so that's what I did in this book. Uh, my sister-in-law's mother is half Indian, so I used her name, which is Naoka. I used a lot of what I'd heard her talk about through the years in this book. So that's what the guardian spirit is about. Then the color of my heart. The, uh, I got the inspiration for this book when I visited the old slave mart in Charleston, West Virginia, in, Char in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I've, I've never experienced anything like that. I don't know if any of you guys have been in that old slave mart or not. But to, to walk those rooms and, and read bill of, bills of sales on people broke my heart. I thought, how in the world did we ever let that happen? How did we let that happen? Mm -hmm. So that's where the story starts in this book. A lady and her five-year-old daughter are sold into slavery. They are brought over on the last slave ship to ever land at Jekyll Island, Georgia. It's called The Wanderer. That is a, uh, that all is true. That's true. Uh, story about the boat, the ship, how many slaves were on board, how many died, how many were thrown over, uh, and some horrible, horrible tales that I found as I researched for this book. But this, but that slave lady was taught how to read by a missionary. So she starts keeping a journal of her life and five generations of, of slave women, grandmothers, whatever you wanna call them, they keep that journal going. And the story starts to really unfold when this lady gets a hold of these journals. Mm. Yeah. And then, y'all know the record keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Now the little, the little uh, book here, The Manger Mouse, my granddaughter was the inspiration behind this. Uh, I was teaching her Sunday school class at the time when I wrote this. She was, she was six, seven years old, something like that. Uh, she's a senior in high school now. Uh, but anyway, I wanted, to write, I wanted to do something special for my little Sunday school class and for my granddaughter for Christmas. So I wrote this little story about Maddie the Manger Mouse. Him and his mommy, they carry straw to the manger all night long because they know the king of kings is coming to their, to their stable. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens is little Maddie is just wore out. He's, he's a baby. He says, Mommy, can I go to sleep now? And she says, well, Maddie, Maddie, if you're willing, there's one more thing if you're willing for you to do tonight. You're the only one in the stable that is small enough to crawl up through this crack here in the manger and lay at baby Jesus' feet and help keep him warm. Aww. So little little Maddie had to make that decision to leave his mommy's nest for the first time and help Jesus. Aww. So there's a message in this book for, for all people. Uh, I wanted someone that I knew to do the illustrations. I looked for two years. I talked to my, my sister does some little things. She could not, she didn't, she couldn't do it. Two or three more people showed me stuff. It just wasn't the right thing. And then uh, one of my old friends, I had not seen in 30 years, her mother passed away. As we talked at the, the funeral home that night, she said, uh, I said, what are you doing, Deb? And she said, well, yeah, I paint a little bit. She said, I do old barns and, and uh, animals, animal portraits. I went, you do? I didn't say a thing to her. She, I said, I'd love to see some of your work. So she emails me, she gets back home to Richmond, Virginia. She emails me some pictures of her stuff and it's perfect because I didn't want this to be glittery. I didn't want this to be showy. I wanted this to be as if it might have been the real thing that night Jesus was born in the, in the, in the manger. So that's why it's like this. It took her a year to do these illustrations. She fell and broke her shoulder during all this. Uh, the devil was way against this book coming out, let me tell you, way against it. But, but uh, Maddie the Manger Mouse, he, he, he won. <laughs> 
I'll tell you, Sarah Bird, all we need to do is just turn you loose. <laughs> I told you you had to tell me to shut up. <laughs> so oh, well. you thought I was quiet, right? <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a halt to this segment and um, ask if there's anybody who has any questions they want to pose. Yes, Molly. Um, you need a mic, Molly? No. Well, take off your mask when you speak. It'll make it a little clearer. Okay. Go ahead. Can you tell us um, about the cover of the Riverkeeper? Yes, I remember you asking me to do that. <clears throat> okay. You, these books had, had already came out when the Riverkeeper was, was in process. Well, people always ask me. I, I go to tons of festivals uh, everywhere. I go, I've been to West Virginia Book Festival, places... Uh, and anyway, they say, who are these people? And I'm saying, they're just, you know, they're stock photos that the publisher came up with to match the people in the book. Um, so whenever I was writing The Riverkeeper, when we first bought our property on the river, Emma was three, my granddaughter was three years old. And we were camping down on the lower end, uh, just with our old, we had a 17 foot hard top glider. It was a 1972 model, and it was wonderful. It wasn't a tent. We had progressed to that, so we were just tickled to death. But we would walk down Walker and we would swing her across mud puddles and just make so many wonderful memories we did. So when I was, uh, when they got to the point to where they were talking about doing the cover, they sent me some examples of what they thought it should look like. And I went, I want Emma, I want my granddaughter on the front of this. We were out west. Well, let me back up. So I took some pictures of her. I brought her to the, to the river one day. I put her in this old trench coat, which <laughs> Callie made, the old yellow trench coat that Callie May wears. Uh, borrowed one from one of the farmers around home. Uh, and did lots of pictures. And just some plain pictures also. And I took pictures of the river. I, that whole day, one, one whole day, all I did was take pictures floating down the river from, like, I think I went to the five mile put in at that point and did that. Uh, so I sent a bunch of these pictures to the publisher and I went, if you could please, could you please use my granddaughter's picture on the front? So we had a trip planned for out west. So we were out west and I get an email from the publisher that says, I'm sorry, we're going to have to proceed with the cover without your granddaughter's picture uh, because it's not, the quality's not good enough. Oh. I went, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I get on the phone to my daughter back here at home, and I tell her the situation. She has a friend who is a semi-professional photographer, has the big cameras, the good stuff. So she gets with Emma, and she takes pictures of her. And, they, and we overnight those pictures to the publisher. Uh, and... So anyway, they get them, they, and then at that point, they can use it. But after this came out, I went, now, that's not the best quality in the world, guys. And mine wasn't good enough, really? <laughs> I mean, really, you're muted over a tree. <laughs> so that's how mine, yeah. Any other? Yes, Dora. Um, it's not a question, but I was, it was a little thing done. At the Heritage Day, I could not walk that far down there to get your book. Yes. Molly bought it for me, and oh. you signed. Okay. And because uh, I'd already read the book, but a friend of mine was had come up and sit beside me, and I told her to take the book and read it because she was looking at it. And she brought it back to me in about another hour, and she said, I cannot take this book and she said it's new and it's signed and you you know it's you need to break it in and I said well I've already read it I want you <laughs> <laughs> but she still wouldn't take it oh. and she said you get at the library sometime right so I have another friend I'm going to take the book to Sunday and I think she will read <laughs> oh awesome <laughs> I call it uh, sharing the love <laughs> Ed's request was that his ashes be put in the river. Yeah. He loved that river. Yeah. And I honored that. So we went over oh. one one day and just put put his ashes in and I don't know where he is now, but I bet he's having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I have had some wonderful times on that river. Yeah. Just like Kelly May. You you're you change, you're you're 
your insides change uh, when you get on that river. You, it's like nothing. It, it's a spiritual experience for me when I get on the river. We, we went fishing probably 10, 15 times this summer. Um, when you get a catch, when you get a, one of those smallmouth bass on your line, there, there's just no feeling like it. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> but there is, I did see a big turtle in there though a few years back. His head was this big. So if you're floating in a tube, be really careful, okay? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I like the fact that there was a ghost in there. Yes. And I was Can you, you take your mask off just <laughs> Uh, I like the fact that there was a ghost in there, and I thought when I was getting ready to come here, I bet there's all kinds of ghost stories about the river and people who have passed there and stuff like that. Are there any, was this modeled after one that you knew yes. about? Yeah, let, let me tell you the story that I'm so glad, because I would have really, really been mad at myself if I had not brought out about the angels. <sighs> angels are everywhere. They're here. They're God's angels. They're not real people. They're not your mamas, your daddies, your brothers, your sisters that came back as an angel. That's not the way God created that God created angels as angels. Uh, there are demon angels. They are the Satan's, they are Satan's angels that left God and went with the devil when he got through out of heaven. Uh, but now let me tell you about little Anna. Okay? Little Anna's my angel in the book. If you remember, I told you there was a fire at the orphanage in 1940. Mm -hmm. I have searched high, low, everything I could possibly search on the internet, anywhere, to find out if any of the children got hurt. Cannot find it anywhere. I'd almost given up when one day I was flipping through research on the computer and I see a photograph that was taken after the fire inside the orphanage. And there was a picture of a, there was a doorway, there was a doorway inside, and there was a picture of a little girl standing there. She had on a pinafore, an old timey dress, pinafore over it and everything. And so there is where my little Anna came in at. Uh, she, she was an, she's an the angel in my book. And now y'all are going to think this is really weird. I think it's really weird. But I saved that picture off the internet. I drug it to my desktop. When I went back to, to use it for something to print it out or whatever, it wasn't there. Oh, no. I, I, it wasn't there. Can't find it on the internet anymore. No, I, I'm, I know it's probably just me threw it away in the trash, but I'm just telling you, Anna disappeared on me. One, she disappeared on me. <laughs> uh, did anybody else pick up who the other angel in the book was? Chloe. Yes, the brother. But no, not the brother, because he never died. Or, well, he wouldn't die anyway, but he, he actually lived uh, when he, baby Coy, you know, he lived. He didn't really, die. he didn't die, but they mis mistook him for the little Hackney boy. Yeah. yeah, they thought he was one of the Hackney children, but he wasn't. He was, he was Callie Mae's little brother, Coy. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, Miss Chloe was, was our other angel. Uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of partial to angels. And what they about me out a few times? <laughs> what about the blonde-headed boy up on the hill? Is he? Wait. Say it a little louder. The blonde-headed boy up on the hill that appeared a couple okay. times. Was he an angel? If you'll remember, toward the end of the book, when Anna is telling uh, Callie May and Chloe how silly they are because they didn't know who she was. Uh -huh. She says something to the fact of, and I was even the little blonde-headed boy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. she she was, she was she did that to show, to tell that. Callie, you know, uh -huh. to warn Callie about yeah. her uncles, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. But it was really Anna, yeah. yeah. Because angels do that, they can change their form. Mm -hmm. they, can, they, can, they can look like somebody we know. It's not them, but they can look like somebody we know, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, so if you or if Cal May was you, um, did you have a Chloe in your life and what mm -hmm. what transpired there? Right. Um, yes, I had probably two or three different Chloe's in my life. Uh, there was a lady named Opal Collins that I grew up with her son. Um, he was two years older than I, but I had a humongous crush on him. Humongous. Uh, 
he would, you know, we would help prime tobacco at my grandpa's, and the first thing I'd ask is, Grandpa, is Larry coming? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hire Larry this time? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Larry died in a car accident when he was 17, oh. and I was 15. Uh, and his mother and I became very close. And if there was such a thing as an angel person, it would be his mother, Opal Collins. She, she was a saint, if there ever was. She lost everything. She lost her son. She lost her husband a few years later with a heart attack. And then her daughter actually died in a car accident too. Uh, no grandchildren, uh, no anything. So we were very tight. We did things together numerous times a week. And she was, she was an inspiration of being an angel-like person. Uh, also, I had an aunt that I was as close to, or maybe closer than I was to my own mother, uh, my daddy's sister, uh, Lafayette Lawrence. I don't know if any of you know her or not. She did live here in Sparta toward the end of her life. About the last 20 years, she lived up in this area. Um, and uh, she lived at Allegheny Manor, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just passed away about five years ago with ALS. And she was another person who uh, loved me unconditionally. And there's not many people in this world who can love you unconditionally, but she did. So thank you for asking that. <laughs> Sarah, um, as a former English teacher at East Brooks High School, and you and I talked at Mountain here. Yes, 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 yes. I was always so interested in my students and how they developed a love for reading and a love for writing. And I'd love to hear your story. Okay. Um, I don't drag trash out that's done been thrown away, but I will say that growing up was tough sometimes. So what I would do was I would grab a pencil and a notepad and I would go down to that river right below my house and I would sit there and I would write a poem about what was bothering me. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember doing this from a very young age. Uh, so I wrote a poem and if you notice in my books, I always start my books out with a poem. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, people ask me if I, uh, if I do an outline for my books, and I do not do outlines for my books because they change. They can, the whole ending can change from what I had previously in my mind. Uh, but, the, but the poem sort of sets the stage for that. Um, so as far as the English part, can I say something else and drag, since you brought that up? People have asked about the dialect in the, in the book. Well, I sort of talk country, if y'all noticed that. <laughs> so we're not surprised at where that, most of that came from, okay? Uh, but it, this was a funny little story. I had a personal editor when I first wrote my first couple of books before I would even give it to the publishing company to, to look at. I wanted it to be as perfect as possible, so I hired my own personal editor. Well, when she started editing The River Keeper, she said, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> she, and she didn't say heck either, okay? Uh -huh. She told it like it was. Uh, she said, what are you doing? You can't do that. You can't talk like that in a modern day book. I said, oh, yes, I can. And I mean, I, I held my ground. And she did research and sent me this big, long, uh, I don't even know if I brought it with me. I've got another folder at the house. But it was like, how sacred the mountain dialect is becoming. <laughs> she said, you were right. I said, well, I don't know if I was right or not, but that book was gonna be wrote that way. Because that's the way I talk, that's the way Kelly May talked. But, uh, but I did like uh, research, this is, this is scripture research right here. But I also did research on, uh, and I'm not sure what that's gonna say, on what the old sayings meant. And it's so interesting, I probably won't be able to find it right now with all this mess, but uh, it's like, you know, when you hear the word, you know, they're with child, yes, we're, mm -hmm. you know, they're with child, they're pregnant. Uh, but I have fun with this right here with, with people. I ask them if they know what these things mean, just a couple of them, I know we're running, running late here. Uh, do you know what an arm baby is? That's an old mountain slang, an arm baby is a child small enough to be carried in someone's arms. Mm -hmm. So, and I got a lot of what mm -hmm. Kelly May said from stuff, from this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you know what a dog trot is? Mm -hmm. Never. It's a covered passageway between two rooms. Mm -hmm. So, of course, oh, I don't yeah. remember, yeah. of course, yeah. I don't know these old things, but these were things that people, this is the way people talk in the mountains. 
I mean, so, you know, you got to use it. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it had to be real, you know? <laughs> it had to be real, so. Sarah, I'm going to go back to my question. Okay. When did you become a reader? Um, and who helped you with your writing? Laws and mercy, honey, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, I hated school. I hated school with a passion. I would play like I was sick as a dog in the morning, so I wouldn't have to go to school. Or if I had to go to school, I would call, I would play sick at school, and my mama would have to come and get me. Okay. Uh, I, and and now I know that I have a little dyslexia that I see things a little backwards sometimes. So I had a hard time. <clears throat> but in third grade, Miss Hunt. <laughs> She was mean to me, okay? <laughs> she, wouldn't, she wouldn't let me get by with playing sick, all right? And she made us go to the library and pick out a book that we had to read and do a book report on. So I, I had to see. So thank the good Lord, I, for some reason, the boxcar children ended up in my hands. And I was in love for life. The Boxcar Children won me over. And it was the original Boxcar Children book. It was not the series that goes with it now. So that's where my love of reading came in. And, and I've never lost that love. Uh, I'm, I've, got something re I'm reading something always. Uh, since I wrote these books in the last 10 years, my reading has really gone downhill <laughs> a lot. But, uh, but now that I've got another book at the publisher, I'm reading again. And I, I love it. I'm in love with reading. Yes. And when you went to high school, did did you have teachers that helped you develop your writing? Uh, uh, or tell me I'm crazy. Yes. Uh, Jack Walker, did you, you remember Jack Walker? Well, Jack Walker was an elderly teacher. He'd been there for 100 years. And he was teaching whatever class it was. It was an English class where you had to analyze poems. Okay? So there was this poem that we all had to an analyze. And... You know, he's going through the papers, blah, 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 you did good, blah, 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 you did good. And then my last name was Martin at the time. He says, and Martin, what the hell was this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, forgive my French, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but that's what he said. He said, what is this? <laughs> because I saw the poem in a whole, lot, a whole different way than anybody else did. And that's just the way I am. I mean... My husband thinks I'm crazy. He says he really does. He says, he says, how do you get that from that? You know? I mean, I'm like, well, I just do. I don't know how. I don't know how. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, oh. I, have a, I didn't hey, say you how old you did. Well, no, I noticed here on the back, uh, Ambassador International, and you've got both the U.S. and the U.K. price. Was this um, uh, published? In Europe, and, and I, I mean, with the dialect and the mm -hmm. history of the river, I just wondered what kind of response. It, it was not that I'm aware of. Oh. Uh, the publisher, uh, Ambassador International, they have a overseas office also. So I'm assuming that's why they put that on the back of their books, is because they're selling the books in both the United States and, and in overseas also. So they may be, but I've never got a, I've never got a royalty check from <laughs> 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 That might be something to look into, okay? Well, <laughs> because I thought you did a really good job with the dialect. The dialect wasn't hard to follow, you know? Right. You didn't have to keep going back and right. saying, oh, that's what she meant. It, it really right. flowed. And, um, and those kinds of books with specific dialect about specific historic locations, sometimes they really catch on, I mean, you know, overseas. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I know there's a there's a West Virginia poet who's a really big deal in Ireland, and mm -hmm. you know they just attached onto his mm -hmm. poetry and um, mm -hmm. the, it really connected. Uh, that, let me say one word about publishing. It's tough. Uh, if you if you don't know, I, I mean I'm just a nobody. <laughs> I mean I'm just a nobody who loves to write a story, who loves to read a story. And thank goodness that other people are enjoying it and getting something from it. Um, but as far as these books ever making it to the big time, unless you know somebody, I, I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours submitting books to publishing companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the big publishing companies say, 
Uh, unless you have an agent, we won't even look at it. Mm -hmm. You don't even bother, we're gonna throw it in the trash. They tell it like it is. Uh, so then you try to find an agent. An agent is harder to find than a publisher. <laughs> um, I have had two publishers. Uh, Guardian Spirit was published by Lucky Press out of Ohio. The woman I was, I will never forget that day that she emailed me and says, can I call you? And I said, yes. So she called me, I went directly to my basement so I'd be all by myself talking to her. And she said, uh, she publishes three books a year is all she publishes. And she said, I want Guardian Spirit to be one of my, one of my books this, this year. And so therefore that's how that was born. Unfortunately, she got very ill. She was her and the marketing person. It was a two woman team is what this publishing company was. Um, and it was wonderful. They taught me so much. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. So anyway, she got terribly sick. She had to close down her publishing company and move to up around the Great Lakes where she could breathe better or something. But uh, we still stay in contact a little bit. So then I had to be on the search for another publishing company. And, but I, came, I was pretty lucky. I got, uh, came up with a small press in Green, Greenville, South Carolina called Ambassador International. Uh, they're a good, they were more of a family team when I started with them. But now a couple of the fa other families, team of people have ventured off to something else. So it's just the guy and the people he hires. So it's not as personal as it once was. But it's okay, they do a good job. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy with them. Uh, I've, I've thought about trying to find another one, uh, but you know, if something's working, why, you know, if they broke, why try to fix it? And so that's why. But it's tough, it's a tough business. I'm not telling you it's easy. <laughs> Anybody else? Did, uh, did you do any research on the uh, 1916? flood versus the 1940 flood. Those are the two that I heard about. Right. Uh, actually, that is in this information about the Virginia floods. Okay. I have seen the 1916, and, but honestly, I did not go in depth with that because I knew I wasn't personally going to use that, yeah. but it is definitely a big deal. <laughs> and while, I, while I'm talking, I've got my mask off. Uh, <laughs> when growing up here in the 60s, uh, you know, the talk was, you know, this is going to be a hydro plant, similar to the Smith Mountain Lake plant on Smith River in Virginia. And I know I had an uncle that went there and looked at the upper lake and lower lake and those kind of scenarios, because these lakes were going to, these dams were going to be built near my home mm -hmm. where I grew up. So uh, I know a lot of you didn't grow up here and, and like some of us did and, and live it. And, right. uh, you know, uh, Certainly, Floyd Krause and then Ed yes. came on and joined him and did a lot of work with that. But the, you're right about the Indian artifacts. That seemed to be the story mm -hmm. that I heard that really what kicked it off mm -hmm. is they covered up a lot of that and hid a lot of that information about the Indian uh, relics yes. and everything. And that got mm -hmm. them really in disfavor with the, right. the people, even after they had the permits. and that fuel the fire to get enough support with Floyd Krause's relationship with Sam Irvin to get this to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Was the Indian artifacts one of the main um, good arguments? <laughs> it, it was, because I think the fact that they were there and they were covered up yeah. and they knew about it and failed to disclose it was one thing, but I think the, the friendship between uh, Floyd Krause and Sam Irvin uh, who were roommates at Harvard Law School mm -hmm. in North Carolina had a big about that? influence because he, Sam Irving, is who introduced it in the in Congress to uh, mm -hmm. it's all the it's good right here. Wild and Scenic River. Mm -hmm. And I believe Ed came in after Floyd died and took over Floyd his Floyd became yeah. really ill. Mm -hmm. And they, I'll tell you, and they call, uh, asked that they send somebody that felt the same mm -hmm. values that, that Floyd had, environmental and the river, right, et cetera. Yeah. And he moved up here from Winston to do yeah. that. And then Floyd died shortly thereafter. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he's quoted in this book numerous times. Uh, if you'll remember a little earlier, I said uh, that, that they, were gonna, they were trying to rob poor Peter mm -hmm. to make it rich Peter. 
uh, as full of Krause's quote, and it's right, mm -hmm. right here on this page. Yeah. So, Sarah, what happened to all the people that sold the water rights off of the property? <laughs> like Richard Dalton's family, I know they did. Did they just get to keep that money? And after everything was done, what happened? Uh, you can answer that because you're that right was a question that a lot better than they me. would call in and ask me, well what do we do with this money <laughs> spend it put it in the bank that's your money now <laughs> <laughs> so they got to keep the property they, they kept the they kept the property they kept the money so. uh -huh. they, yeah. the fortunate uh -huh. one now not everybody uh -huh. was able to do that is my understanding from reading some stuff some people <laughs> that sold out the power company wouldn't sell it back to them uh, is my understanding that I guess they were just being mean, uh, like they were known to be being mean. So, you know, they had already sold it to them. I know. So um, they had the they, money in, and they and went, then the yeah. and it was but not they flooded, wouldn't, so. and But they wouldn't let some of them back on the property, is what I've, what I've read. So, Are they um, still own some of the property around here? You know, in the 70s they did. When this book was written in 1979, it said that they still owned uh, quite a bit of property around. But I do not know percentage-wise. Larry, At Larry Atwood told me that he knew for a fact that they still owned a lot of property around here, and he's passed. He passed away. I'm gonna guess six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, we would probably be very surprised at the what they still do own around here. You're gonna get my wheels are rolling out. I'm gonna have to look for that. <laughs> <laughs> As I read it, it was like, wow, I wonder if these things really happened. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you just brought it all to life with yes. everything that you share. This was just incredible. Yes. Um, and turtles. I'm going to have to search the Bible for turtles. <laughs> <laughs> and the ice, you know, just it just brought it to life. You know, we don't, we don't realize sometimes when we're not there, you know, the experiences that people have, and then it becomes history, and then it becomes lost, but you brought it to life again. Thank you so much. You are. It's my pleasure. I'm Joellen Carson. I'm actually a member of our Blue Ridge Read Committee, which is a very democratic committee. We don't really have a leader, <laughs> but I'd like to um, thank the committee. If you would please stand. We're a small but mighty bunch, and you're very shy now, so go ahead and stand. <laughs> around these um, books that we choose for the community to read and enjoy and discuss. And um, that was one thing that Cindy Atwood did was she led the community conversation around the book. Um, in this particular case, the fact that so much was right here in our community. And you know, the people go back and we couldn't stop this. I mean, this was what, I was hoping all along we would hear some about, not just about the book. So this was just really special. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also just recognize that we are a project of the Allegheny Arts Council, and we're very thankful for that support. Um, also, the North Carolina Arts Council. I'm thankful for all of you that have come out to hear this tonight. And I bet that you're leaving just as excited as I am. So thank you for coming. You know, there are books back here um, that she will sign and you'll have an autographed copy if you're interested. So enjoy that. Um, this particular year, we've never done this before, but this year is in honor of Bonnie Vaughn. Um, many of you know her. You probably have seen her around town. She was the walker and she was everywhere. And most of where she was walking to was somewhere that she could serve. You know, whether it was at Allegheny Cares or at the nursing home or, you know, wherever, the senior center. And in fact, she was probably our biggest cheerleader. Mm -hmm. um, she would take a book 
you know, I would buy a book for her so that she could read it at the senior center, take it to the nursing home. She one time wrote a letter that was four pages long of all the people that she had <laughs> given it to, and they, you know, got it back from her, got it back to her. It even went out to Arizona to, uh, yeah. I think it was a niece or something that got to read it. Um, she would bring fresh flowers from her garden to our events. So just a very special lady. She passed away last year, shortly before her 90th birthday. She would have loved to hear all of this, having grown up in Sparta herself. So I would ask you to stay tuned for next year's Blue Ridge Read. Um, you normally, you don't hear about it till closer to the time, but share it with your friends too. If this was special for you, go ahead and share it with your friends. And then I, I wanna say one more thing. There are um, many activities that the Allegheny Arts Council offers. And so the next big activities that are coming up are the, back, the, the beat goes on. So that will be happening. You'll see that in the paper. Uh, just one more thing. I think we're very lucky to have this focus on the arts and on reading and on writing in our community. And it's thanks to uh, the interest of a lot of people here and other writers in the group and all of that. So. Have a safe trip back to your home. Can, well, I, can I add one other thing too? To sure. Read, because nobody's mentioned this so far. The Reed has donated for the last several years books to put in the little free libraries that are all over our county. And so we were we were happy that um, you know a book went into each one of those along with bookmark that goes with the book. And um, I was at Thistle Meadow Library, which is one of the book uh, the little free libraries that I take care of, and I had put one in the Friday before, and then the next Sunday, I said, when are we going to get our copy of the book, uh, The River Keeper? And I said, well, I just put it in last week. It was gone. And I checked several of my other little free libraries, and they, they were gone. I mean, the minute it, if I had taken a picture of it, I wouldn't have proof that I actually did. <laughs> Is there a, a list of where those little libraries are? Debbie yeah, has most of them. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That would be nice to say. Yeah. Barbara? Um, I never pass up the opportunity as president of the Allegheny <laughs> Arts Council to let you all know that our And the Beat Goes On first one is tomorrow night at Muddy Creek Music Hall, Jonathan Bird. So it is a bird weekend. <laughs> Sarah Bird, <laughs> Jonathan Bird. So please come and join us at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. This is wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you, y'all. Thank you, y'all.